7 o'clock, March 29th, uh, we'll get started. We can see people coming into the uh, webinar right now. Thanks all for tuning in on another sunny night, or at least sunny in the Okanagan. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, this is the BCWF Conservation Webinar on the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project. Um, this year's update from uh, PhD candidate Chloe Wright. Uh, my name is Jesse Zima. I'm the executive director of the BC Wildlife Federation. Uh, the reason we have a great webinar is to help educate our members and the public and stakeholders and First Nations and researchers um, to give them better information for when they're talking to their peers and co-workers and meeting with their elected officials. Um, I'm really excited because I haven't seen this presentation yet. Uh, really excited to see where we're at. Um, and really fortunate to have uh, one of our two PhD candidates from the project here tonight. Um, this project started probably seven years ago um, and took quite a bit to get up and running and now it's going full steam um, with a ton of collaborators, funders and partners. And I'm sure uh, Chloe will touch on them at the end of her presentation or I'm guessing. Um, anyways, format for tonight, presentation will probably be around 45 minutes or less followed by um, a quick, you know, one minute break and then some question and answer after that. Um, as always, uh, Chloe is a researcher and a scientist. She is not an elected official or a wildlife manager. So if you feel your blood pressure raise and you have a question which you think might be pointed, better pointed at your MLA, um, please feel free to send it that way um, and not to Chloe function. Uh, both on Zoom and in the comment section on Facebook Live. You can post your questions. We will put them all together and then at the end I will ask Chloe uh, the questions. We'll kind of organize them thematically. Uh, so, uh, quick background. Chloe is originally from the Lower Mainland. Uh, she lived there until she was 10 and then moved away to warm and sunny Florida. <laughs> She received her bachelor's uh, degree in biology at the University of Florida in 2011, where she conducted undergrad research on eastern bluebird nesting behavior. She then worked as a wildlife technician for three and a half years on research projects studying white-tailed deer, black bears, coyotes, wolves, and bobcats throughout Midwestern USA. And she received her master's of science in 2018 from the University of Montana. Um, her focus was on uh, white-tailed deer survival movements and resource selection in Missouri. Uh, she moved back to BC in 2018 where she began her PhD at UBCO, working on the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project under Dr. Adam Ford. Um, so we're really excited uh, to have you tonight, Chloe, and if you want to start your presentation, go ahead. Um, in other news, um, we're, Chloe is, is goaling for uh, September 2023 finish date for her PhD and we're all excited for that. Um, so over to you Chloe, thanks. Yeah, thanks Jesse. Um, yeah, I guess now I have to finish by September 2023. Um, <laughs> okay, so okay hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes, Jesse says yes. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna move that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so thanks everyone um, for being here today and thanks Jesse for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project. Um, but I'd like to first acknowledge that I am presenting to, to you today from the traditional territory of the Silk uh, people. And although this research forms the basis of my PhD, um, particularly the migration stuff I'm going to talk about today, this research is, or this project is also the largest collaborative uh, mule deer research project in the history of BC. So I'd just like to start off by acknowledging um, our major collaborators. And so that's uh, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, the Bonaparte Indian Band, the Okanagan Nations Alliance, the BC Wildlife Federation, and the University of Idaho. Yeah, so um, if this is your first time learning about Sim Deer, if you've never heard me talk before or Sam Foster talk before, I'd recommend going to our website and watching the other presentations that we've done. They're on YouTube. Um, it has more background about the project itself and what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, whereas this project or this presentation today is gonna be mostly about migration. So I'm gonna start off talking about a general background on migration, highlight our study areas, 
uh, talk about some field methods. I will give a quick update on the capture and survival information because I haven't given a talk to BCWF uh, for about a year and a half now. So we have some, some updated information that you might be interested in, um, but then we'll get into the migration results um, when we'll look at uh, how long migration is, where it is, why, um, and then yeah, look at a habitat model. So what types of habitats are deer using when they're migrating? So we'll just start off with a little definition, just we're all on the same page about what is migration. So migration is the movement between distinct seasonal ranges, and it allows migrants to exploit resources that are abundant in one seasonal range while avoiding deficits in another. And so migrations can be incredibly large. If you think about um, some birds, like an Arctic tern, they migrate between the Arctic and the Antarctic in a 22,000 kilometer journey. But not everybody migrates this far, right? There are some um, amphibians that only migrate a few kilometers between um, their two ranges. Uh, but the thing to remember with migration is that it's movement between two distinct seasonal ranges, which is usually between a wintering ground and a breeding area. And so I just wanted to start off by making sure we all know what migration looks like. So this here is a video. Um, oh shoot, will it start? Ah, well, it worked earlier. Oh yeah, she's moving. Okay, cool. So you see this deer um, shooting up forward. She goes to her summer range. She comes back down to her winter range. And you can see that there's no movement in between those times. She's either on one range or the other, or she's migrating between them. Um, and so this deer now is an example of what migration is not. So this deer does move quite a bit, but she's moving between these ranges um, throughout the year. So she's not making distinct movements between one or the other. She's kind of zipping back and forth. And so we would call this a resident deer. Um, and then this is another example of a more classical resident deer um, in which she spends basically her entire lives on these hills above Midway. And so she moves a lot less. But so in the future, when I talk about resident animals, I mean deer that um, do not migrate and then migratory animals make these distinct movements um, uh, all, it, twice a year. So why would animals migrate? Um, so migratory species can exploit resources that are present in different areas of the globe at different times of the year. And this is because they cannot live in the same area all year. This could be due to seasonal limitations in temperature, uh, food availability, weather, or other factors. And so they've evolved to be capable of uh, moving from one region to another. And migration tends to be most common in areas where resources change in a predictable manner. And so here in BC, um, we know that winter arrives typically every October and November and spring arrives every April and May. And this enables animals like mule deer to know when the onset of spring is and they can then move in a predictable fashion as opposed to just guessing like, oh, maybe today is the day I migrate. Um, they kind of know because this happens in a, um, in a predictable way every year. And so the migration route itself can be really important, um, but it's not important for all species. So for some species, it's just a way to connect two seasonal ranges. And they just move really quickly with no stopping from point A to point B. And so an example of this would be a bar-tailed godwit, which is a bird, and they fly 10,000 kilometers in seven days without stopping before they reach the Yellow Sea. And so this is a species where perhaps the route that they take is less important than the destinations. Um, but other species use resources along the way while they're migrating that can significantly impact their movement, energy gain, survival, and reproduction. So these animals tend to take slower, longer movements, and they stop along the way where they'll rest and eat. And then they can also trap resources along the way to maximize energy gain. So this could be green up for deer, um, but a bird called a surf scoter, they pursue waves of herring, uh, spawning herring along the way. So the herring will spawn and they will eat them as they migrate. So, um, that was a little general introduction on, on migration, but now I'll talk more about mule deer migration specifically. And so here in the Northern Hemisphere, um, the only place where mule deer exist, they typically migrate um, to high elevation summer ranges in the spring, and this is where they give birth. And this is prompted or thought to be prompted by the start of spring green up. And then in the winter time, uh, they return to their low elevation winter ranges. This is typically where they breed. Um, and this return to their low elevation winter range is prompted by winter weather. 
And so this means that twice per year, they're moving through complex and potentially dangerous areas to reach their destinations. Because uh, mule deer spend most of their time on their winter or summer ranges, they know those areas pretty well. But during migration, they can be traversing about 100 kilometers to get from one place to another, and they might not know that area as well. And so it can be a risky time for deer. Um, another interesting fact about mule deer is that they show very little flexibility in terms of whether or where they migrate. So this is in contrast to other species like elk, white-tailed deer, moose, roe deer, red deer. Um, all those ungulates can decide to migrate one year and not migrate another year. Um, but mule deer do not do this. So in a study of 312 individual mule deer and 882 deer years, uh, this Sawyer et al. study found that zero deer switched strategies. So mule deer either migrated every year or they did not, and there was no in between. And then they also found in terms of where they're migrating, that these mule deer migrated to the same, uh, migrated on the same routes every single year. So they found that their routes overlapped by about 80%. And um, we found that here as well, right? So this, I've shown this figure before in a previous uh, presentation, but this just shows the high overlap um, between, uh, between successive years. But this is unfortunately a bummer for mule deer because flexibility can provide an advantage, right? So species that are able to switch migratory behaviors, their residents one year, uh, Margaret or the other, um, and also those that can shift their roots are more resilient to land use changes. So unlike mule deer who are migrating um, and they're following the exact same path, it really makes you wonder what happens if there was a giant fence or road built right in the middle of their um, route. What would they do because they've been shown to be very inflexible? And so most of what we know about mule deer migration um, comes from work done in Wyoming and Colorado. And perhaps you've seen this um, image or you've heard about deer 255 before. So this is the longest mule deer migration on record. So she migrated one way, uh, 242 miles, which is 390 kilometers um, from her uh, winter range to her summer range. So that's super far. And these folks in Wyoming have done a great job. They've got a lot of cool like videos and um, stuff like that if you're interested. And they also have um, learned a lot about mule deer migrating in these regions. And they found that um, in these locations, mule deer tracks spring green up. Uh, they use areas that are um, dry, low elevation with low anthrop anthropogenic disturbance. And they also use areas that are characterized by sagebrush steppe. And then they also are long, right? So both in distance and time. So on average, 18 to 144 kilometers, and it takes them about three weeks. Um, and so you might be thinking, well, Chloe, we know everything there is to know about mule deer migration. Why are you talking about this? Um, and that's because of course, uh, Wyoming is not BC and in a lot of different ways. So this is kind of a typical migratory, I took this picture from the Wyoming Mig Migration Initiative. They've got some really cool photos, but you can see this would be um, the areas that mule deer would be migrating through there towards that um, mountain in the background, which would be where their summer range is. And so um, if you think about BC, sure, some parts of BC do look rather similar to that. I took this picture in um, South Central BC. Uh, but a lot of BC looks really different, right? So not only do we have totally different habitats, there's very little sagebrush step here. Um, we have a lot of forests and we also have a lot of forestry impacts that hasn't been previously studied. Those studies in Wyoming and Colorado have done a lot of work on oil and gas extraction, so well pads and that kind of thing, but haven't really looked too much at um, other impacts that we see here, which is mostly forestry. So my goal for this, um, this chapter of my PhD, for lack of a better word, uh, was to understand um, what migration looks like for mule deer in a forested disturbed area. So this includes things like where, when, how long, and what habitats are they using. Yeah, so um, I'll just jump right into it. So these are our three study areas. If you've, again, seen a talk about sim deer before, you would already know this. So we have the Boundary, the West Okanagan, and Cache Creek regions, and they're all different uh, in many different ways, and you would know that uh, if, if you live in any of these regions. Um, so within these three study areas, our goal has been to maintain a sample size of 30 adult females collared per study area per year. 
and then also uh, 20 juveniles per study area per year. And so these juveniles um, include both neonates and six month old fawns. So we catch the neonates in the uh, summer and then we do another round of capture in December. And so uh, when we started the project, the goal was to have three full winters of this work. So winter 1819 was the first winter, and then winter 2020, 2021 was supposed to be our last winter of capture, um, but you, you will see that that has not been the case. Um, yeah, so then to catch the, the adults and the six-month-old fawns, we use helicopter net gunning, uh, dark gunning and also um, clover traps. And then when we have the deer in hand, we do a whole suite of samples and um, a bunch of things that, again, I'm not going to touch on here today. And then to catch neonates, it's slightly different, right? You can't helicopter net gun a tiny little deer. Um, so what we do is we use locations from collared females to pinpoint areas that they have likely given birth, and then we go search for the neonates. So this is the locations of an adult female from May 26th to May 28th. And you can see she's moving quite a bit, like around the... Um, around the area. So I would look at this and say, oh yeah, she's just, she's moving. I don't think she's given birth yet. And then the next day, uh, we see a cluster that looks like this. And so these are her locations from May 30th to June 1st. And we see this cluster is about 250 meters by 100 meters. And you see this um, really characteristic clustering of locations and you know, okay, that deer is given birth. And then we can go walk around that site um, until we find the cute little deer. And so, um, yeah, searching for neonates is one of my favorite times of year. Uh, you all, we always walk through a bunch of different habitats. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy, um, but it's always a good time. And then, yeah, similar to the adults, we take a bunch of samples and measurements um, and data, although we are much less invasive with these small deer than we are with the adults um, because they're only a few days old when we catch them. So the most important thing we put on these deer are the collars, and that's because these collars tell us where the deer are and also when they die. Um, and then depending on the age of the deer, they get a different collar. So adult females get the largest collar, which is on the left there. Um, it weighs 650 grams. It just has a larger battery than the one in the middle, which we give to six-month-old fawns. You can see it has um, elastic uh, up at the top. And then this collar weighs about 450 grams. And then this collar on the right over here is uh, the neonate collar and it weighs only 140 grams. And the neonates, we always weigh the deer first before we put the collar on because we wanna make sure that the collar only weighs um, less than 10% of their body weight. And so it has happened that we have caught neonates that are too light. Um, they don't meet our weight threshold and then we can't collar them because we don't want to think that the collar is impacting um, their survival. So um, because those collars are a lot smaller, they work differently than the two um, on the left, than these two bigger collars. So I'm just gonna talk about how, how these two collars work. Um, yeah, I won't mention too much about those ones but they do give us survival information. So the collars collect uh, one location every four hours and 15 minutes. You can see this uh, little goofy deer sending a location to the satellites. And then every 17 hours, I get new locations sent to my computer. So it's after it's taken um, four locations, I get those four locations sent to my computer. So I don't have quite um, real time information on the deer, but it's pretty close um, and it's super cool. And then the collars also send a mortality notification um, once the collar has been stationary for at least six hours. Yeah, so this is just another diagram. This is or figure. This is kind of what the locations look like when they arrive on uh, my computer, and you can see that um, obviously the they're always four four hours and. 15 minutes apart, um, and the, the larger the distance between them just move, means they moved more in that time, because um, those have also been taken every four, four hours and 15 minutes. Okay, so in terms of captures, uh, so in previous winters, we've caught a total of 152 adults and 157 fawns. And again, if you want a bigger breakdown of how this broke down between study areas, years, and ages, um, you can look at uh, some previous presentations that I've given. Um, yeah, and so this winter, you probably remember that we, like I mentioned, um, that 
we weren't even supposed to really do much capture this winter. Um, it was kind of uh, the end of our project, um, at least my portion of it. But after last summer, perhaps you remember, it was uh, really dry, really smoky, tons of crazy weather patterns. And we were really interested to see how that summer might impact fawn survival this winter. And so we um, realized we had enough money and collars left over to capture uh, six month old fawns in two out of our three study areas. So that's why you'll see here in Cache Creek, we didn't catch any fawns this past winter there. Um, and that's not because we forgot, uh, it's because we didn't have enough money and it wasn't in our original plan, right? We already have three full winters from that region and we just um, managed to make it work in the boundary in the Okanagan. But we did have money for more adult collars, and so that literally just happened uh, last week. They wrapped that up, where we caught 15 adults in the boundary, um, and 12 fawns were caught earlier in the winter, plus five neonates that were left over from the summer, so they count now because they've aged up. So we had a total of 17 fawns um, collared this winter in the boundary. In the Okanagan, we had 17 adults um, that were just collared and 16 neonates, or excuse me, 16 fawns collared earlier in the winter. And then in Cache Creek, they just collared 16 um, new adults. So for neonate captures, our first year of neonate captures was in the spring of, um, I'm just realizing you guys can probably see that and that's really annoying for you, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so the neonate captures, uh, the spring of 2019 um, was our, pilot study. So we were just trying to make sure that we could actually do um, the things that we set out to do. So we didn't want to start off with a whole bunch of callers and then just realize we couldn't do it. So we started off with just a small amount. Um, and then in the spring of 2020, our goal was to collar uh, 20 neonates per study area. And you can see that we met that goal in 2020. And then last winter, or excuse me, last summer, we did our last uh, round of captures. And again, we met or exceeded our goal in all three study areas. Um, yeah. So currently we have collared um, 189 deer that are on air right now. Uh, and so that's, um, yeah, 40 to 50 adults per region, 10 to 11 or 10 to 12 yearlings per region, and then some fawns as well. Uh, yeah, so now we'll just get into some uh, survival results. So this figure here shows um, the survival of adult females um, annually in the boundary region. And so this combines all of our years together. So from 2018 to the present, and then it shows adult survival from um, April until um, end of March. <laughs> That's a year. Yeah, so in the boundary region, adult survival is 76%. And if we compare that to the West Okanagan, it's a bit lower. So West Okanagan adult uh, female survival is 85%, and in the Cache Creek region, adult female survival is 86%. So it is a bit concerning. Um, if you look at other literature, adult female survival is generally uh, about 80-something percent, so it being 76% is a bit low in the boundary, um, and that is something that I will be diving into in future, um, in future work uh, to try and figure out kind of what's going on. But um, yeah, so that's coming, TBD, uh, what's going on in the boundary. And then in terms of uh, fawn survival, so this is fawn over winter survival, uh, all of the years combined in the boundary region. And uh, we can see that, so this is from December until the beginning of June, we can see that survival in the boundary region is about 66% for these um, juvenile deer. And then in the West Okanagan, um, the fawn overwinter survival is 68%, and in Cache Creek, uh, fawn winter survival is 63%. So quite similar between all three study areas when we um, pool all of the years together, and we can see kind of a characteristic um, drop off in survival kind of in the wintertime, as you might expect, and then it levels off um, in, in April uh, and May. 
And then for neonate survival, um, this was actually quite surprising. So in the boundary this year, uh, neonate survival from the day they were born until 12 weeks of age, uh, neonate survival is was 65%. And I don't know if you guys remember from previous talks, but um, neonate survival in 2020 was like 30%. So this was crazy, a lot higher. And we were quite surprised by this number. And this same trend occurred in the Okanagan as well. Survival to 12 weeks of age for neonates was 52 percent um and in cash creek it was quite low uh or not quite low but as low as it was in previous years which is about 30 to 40 percent and you can see this big drop off in the first few weeks of life which um, is quite typical for deer this age they get eaten quite fast and then kind of levels off towards the end um or as they get older. And so, like I said, this was quite surprising because we didn't expect neonate survival to be this high. And then we thought, oh, well, that's awesome. That's going to be a great year for deer. Um, but if we look at neonate survival and just extend the time frame out, so now instead of weeks on the x-axis, we have um, months on the x-axis. And you can see that by six months of age, uh, neonate survival is 30% in the boundary. 33% in the Okanagan and 15% in Cache Creek. So, and there, again, there are quite, I didn't mention this in the other ones, but there are quite large confidence intervals. And that's just because of, um, we only call her 20. Um, but yeah, the average is the, is the dark and then this uh, number here. And so, yeah, so this is kind of more typical um, and shows that maybe just, you know, maybe they make it out of the summer just fine, but then in the fall, um, some neonates are still quite small and weak um, and they don't quite make it um, to the winter. Um, and I know these numbers look alarming. You're saying like, oh my gosh, only 30% of all the deer that are born actually make it to the winter time. Um, and that does seem alarming, but these numbers are quite typical um, from other studies in other, um, in other areas. So in Idaho, they also had pretty low survival, 30 to 40% um, for neonates, but coupled with high adult survival and, uh, um, and the high birth rates that they have, uh, their populations still increase despite these seemingly very low um, survival rates. So um, yeah, so what are the deer dying of? So these are the adult uh, females and the six-month-old fawn mortality sources. We can see that predation made up the majority of our um, mortalities, with cougars being the number one source of mortality. And then um, we, we've got a couple coyotes, wolves, bears. And then, um, yeah, probable coyote and probable cougars are just ones that we didn't have enough evidence to obviously definitively say it was one of those species, but we think that it was one of them. And then, um, we also have other, so there's 39 mortalities that didn't fit into predation. Uh, 20 of those are unknowns, and that's unfortunately sometimes we get to these dead, these areas where the deer are dead, and there's just not much left, or in the summer there's not a lot of sign left behind, right? There's no tracks and that kind of thing, so it can make it really hard to figure out what happened. Um, yeah. And then uh, for neonate mortality sources, they're a bit different. Um, the majority of these are unknown, and that's just because these deer are so small that by the time we get there, there's often nothing left. So you can see in this picture over here, um, there's just some hair and then the collar, and that's pretty typical. And so it's so hard to know what happened to this deer. You can't. Um, and then sometimes we, we do get um, more remains left and we can kind of figure out what happened. And so of the, um, of the predators that we could uh, definitively say we're there. Um, bears are our number one source of mortality for neonates, but again, there's quite a lot that are unknown. Okay, so now that's kind of my update, quick update on um, survival and capturing, and now we're going to move more onto the collar, like movement and migration stuff. So for the collar locations, um, we've collected over 1.2 million locations since the project started in March of 2018. And on average, we've got about 1,200 locations per deer. Uh, but some of these deer have been collared since March of 2018, and those collars have collected over 9,000 locations. So um, of the 243 deer that were still collared by the start of spring migration, uh, 180 of them were migratory and 63 were not. So that's about 74% of our collared deer are migratory and 26% are not. Um, 
And this figure here just shows the different migratory routes. And so we can see in the boundary region, they tend to migrate from south to north. In the Okanagan, they tend to go from east to west. And in Cache Creek, they go from um, south to north. And so this slide and the next one has a bunch of numbers on it. It just has the average spring migration. This one's that spring migration start and end dates on average uh, by year and steady area. Um, but I just wanted you to show that, or I just wanted to show that they are um, pretty similar uh, throughout the years. So in the boundary, we can see that on average, spring migration started at the beginning or mid-May and went until about the end of May uh, in all four years. In the Okanagan, we see something really similar. Uh, Mid-May to late May is kind of our peak migration times, um, but these migrations are a bit shorter, and so the end, the end dates are a bit sooner than in the boundary region. And in Cache Creek, we see again the same thing, this early to mid-May start, and then to a uh, mid to late May end. And then in the fall, uh, again, we see a really similar trend. So these are fall migration start and end dates. So they're starting uh, on average, um, end of September, beginning of October. It does seem like in 2020, they were a bit later, started mid-October. And then the West Okanagan, again, we see the same thing, late September, early October, with one year, um, a bit of a later start there, October 11th, going till about uh, early to mid-October. And in Cache Creek, again, the same thing, uh, late September, early October, going to um, early, early to mid-October. So that's kind of our peak time frames uh, for migration start and end for the spring uh, would be mid to late May, and for the fall is uh, mid to late, or er, early to mid-October. And then in terms of migration distances in the three areas, uh, the minimum migration distance in all three study areas is about eight kilometers. And so these migration distances are all as the crow flies. Um, so they're, if you add up their actual path, they're going to be moving a bit more. Um, and then the maximum is quite large. So there's quite a lot of variability from eight kilometers to 106 kilometers in the boundary. And the Okanagan and Cache Creek, you can see it's about 90. And then, um, but on average, they're moving about 40 to 50 kilometers. And so these are just one-way distances also. And then in the fall, they migrate the same distance back. And then in terms of how long these migrations are taking, so in the boundary, in all three regions, they take about a day. Uh, that would be the minimum. And that's because if you think about walking eight kilometers, even I can walk eight kilometers in a day. So it makes sense that that would be their shortest um, time frame. And then their maximum uh, in the boundary took uh, almost 11 weeks, that's 80 days, Okanagan 60 days, and Cash Creek 67 days. So pretty similar for the max. But on average, they're taking about a week to two weeks um, with the longer migrations again seen in the boundary region in the spring. And then in the fall, we see the same thing where the minimum uh, length is the same, it's one day. And then the maximum is actually a little bit longer in the boundary. So there, we had one, one migration that took 120 days in the boundary. Uh, whereas in the Okanagan and Cache Creek, it, the maximum is a lot shorter, it's 40 and 80 days. But on average, these migrations are taking again between 10, um, between a week to two weeks, right? So nine, uh, nine or 18 days being the average. And so I was curious about this deer that took 120 days to migrate. And so I pulled up her locations and I realized um, that she's spending a lot of time in this purple circle here. So this is her spring migration is on the side and then fall migration is coming back down and she pops off to the side here and spends um, a lot of time here. So she starts here in November 11th and she leaves here December 30th. So you could even call this um, stopover or this portion, you could consider this to be kind of like a secondary winter range because she spent about six weeks there. And then in terms of overlap, I've touched on this before, but we did see that these deer have really high overlap between years um, and study areas. So in the boundary region, on average, um, the overlap between successive years between their migration uh, routes is um, on average uh, just below 75%. In Cache Creek and the West Okanagan, it's um, over 80%. And so that's kind of in line with what they saw in that Wyoming study, that there's really high site fidelity to these migratory routes from year to year. 
And then this is just a little video here. I've, I've shown these before, but they're quite fun. So this has the timer up at the top and then you can see the deer uh, starting to migrate um, as time goes on. And so this is their spring migrations. Um, you can kind of see where they started uh, to where they're going. Yeah, we can see by the end of um, June, excuse me, beginning of June, uh, most deer are already on their summer ranges. And then if we look at fall migration, so this is the same figure uh, just in reverse, right? So this is beginning of September. Uh, we see a couple of deer um, working their way down south, but um, it really starts to pick up here towards the end of September. And yeah, now we're in the beginning of October and they've really made it um, pretty much all the way back. So um, yeah, so I, I want to talk a little bit more about the different parts of migration. So we can think about migration occurring in two different areas. So corridors and stopovers. And corridors are these areas where mule deer are migrating through. So we don't see a buildup of locations in any one area. These are just areas where deer are kind of, I just think of them on the move. You know, they're just trying to, they're just trying to get somewhere. And so these locations would be an example of a corridor. Versus a stopover is an area where a mule deer spent at least one day. And so, um, and these are areas, yeah, that they are likely using um, resources, they're probably resting. Um, and so they spend a little bit more time. And so in this figure here, um, these would be our stopovers. You can see the locations have piled up. And then another thing to know about migration and the way our locations come in is that we don't know where these deer are every moment of the day, right? So they're taken every four and a quarter hours. And so we can imagine that this line that's drawn between these two successive locations might not actually be where the deer went. Um, so we can imagine that perhaps the deer went off to the right, um, uh, to this blue line, uh, but it's also possible that they went over to the um, to the green section, right? So we don't know for sure where deer were in these areas where we didn't observe them. But we can use a model to show predicted probabilities of use between known locations. And so um, what that looks like is just kind of this heat map here um, where the model, uh, yeah, just kind of makes it looks like a buffer, if nothing else, between our known locations. And so in this one, the darker colors are areas of higher probability of use, and the lighter colors are a lower probability of use. And so you can see all the locations where, uh, or all the areas where the locations are, are quite dark. That's because the model knows the deer was there. Um, and then in the areas connecting them, they're a little bit lighter, um, but uh, not too much, right? So this gives us a, a general idea now of, of the spaces that the deer could have been when we didn't directly observe them. And then we can again think of this as our stopovers and corridors and we can pretty easily um, pick this out on this map. And so you'll see this in a future slide, but these green polygons that I'll draw are the stopover locations. So I've just highlighted them here for you. Um, yeah, so in order to understand what habitats deer are selecting for while they're migrating, I used a habitat model. And this model is used to identify yeah, features that are preferentially used or avoided by a species. And the way this model works is that it compares habitat features at used points, so uh, locations where the deer were, as well as available points, so areas where the deer could have been. And then it compares the ratio of these two used to available to figure out um, what they prefer. And so you might just be thinking, well, I don't know why we can't just quantify what's inside of their migration route. So say, okay, there's 75% of their migration route is new cup blocks, so therefore they must love new cup blocks. Um, but I like to relate things to myself and to people to make it more understandable. So this is just an example. Um, but yeah, I live in a basement suite and it has a large living room, uh, but a small bedroom and a small bathroom. So if you just looked at my apartment as my home range and saw that my living room was really big, you would think the living room is the most important room in my house and the bathroom and bedroom, not so much. Um, and so maybe we could get rid of them, right? 
No. Uh, so if you look at how much time I spend in each of these rooms relative to the size of them, you would realize that I spend way more time in my bedroom and my bathroom, given their size, than I do in my living room. And so that would help you understand that that's a really important feature for me in my home, whereas perhaps the living room, even though it makes up the largest portion of my house, is maybe not the most important part of my house. Okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, this model needs used locations, and so these are our uh, stars, yellow stars, and those are within a stopover. These are locations where deer were, um, and I just took the polygon away so you can see it. And then we also need availables, and these are points and locations that could have been used by a deer, but we didn't directly observe them there. And so these are all these purple locations are available. And you can see there's way more available locations than there are used. And this is um, because the model needs about 10 available locations per use location in order for it to like do its math. Um, and all of this was done remotely sensed. So I didn't go out to all of these locations and figure out what was there. I did it all via um, a GIS software and same with like picking these random points. And so, um, yeah, at each of these points, we can then look at things that we think might be important to deer. And just a quick note about these habitat models, um, they require me to spend a lot of time on my computer and you might think it's pretty easy, right? Like just looking at maps and looking at deer where, where deer go, uh, but it's actually quite a bit more complicated than that. There's like a lot of coding and like things that are way above where I think I'm at. Um, but the only reason I bring this up is just to say that these things take a long time. So, um, so yeah, just be patient with the results phase of any study, um, but particularly one where there's a PhD student involved or a master's student um, because they are learning and these things just take a lot of time. So just a plug there. Uh, but from these models, all that time spent at my computer, we can infer what habitats a deer needs. Um, and then we can generate maps that show predicted probabilities of use of an area that we got from these maps. Um, and then these can be used in conservation planning and management. So these habitat models turn these used and available locations into a heat map that looks like this. And we can see um, the darker colors are areas that they're more likely to use and the lighter colors are less likely to use. And so these models scale up from the individual level to the population level. Um, and so this means that we're kind of predicting what the average deer would like. So just because um, one deer likes something and another deer likes something different, like deer are individuals just like people are, but what this model is trying to do is just kind of figure out what an average uh, deer would be into. And then also just because an area has a low probability of use doesn't mean a deer will never go there. So on some of these maps, if you see areas like, oh, deer, I always see deer there. Um, I'm not saying that they won't be there, but I'm just saying that they prefer these other areas. Areas. So um, yeah, we'll get into some results here. So just a reminder, I have three study areas, two models in each, which is six models total, and this is only spring migration. Um, so I'm just going to kind of highlight, um, present some highlights here. And again, this is only spring migration. So all of the figures that I'm going to show here um, are similar to this, in which we have uh, the variable changing on the x-axis, and then this relative selection strength here on the y, and then we'll have stopovers versus corridors. And so this is elevation in the boundary. And what this figure is showing us is the probability of a deer choosing another habitat feature compared to the habitat features where they are. And these um, locations only differ in one habitat feature. So these are locations that only differ in elevation, but everything else about them is the same. So this figure here is a deer that is at 975 meters of elevation. And so when they're at 975 meters of elevation, their probability of moving to 975 is one, right? They're not leaving, they're not, they're staying, right? It's just their probability is one. But if you want to know what their probability of moving to 1,275 meters, which is the peak of this, we can see that they are, um, yeah, so here I forgot I wrote this down. 975 meters, so the probability of moving to 1,275 meters is um, 3.6 because we can see this on the x or on the y axis. And if there's a star next to it, that means that it was a significant result in the model. And so basically what this means is that things below this line they're avoiding and things above the dotted line they prefer compared to where the two lines meet, right? So we can see here that in the boundary and stopovers, they really like these intermediate elevations, not so much the higher and lower elevations. 
And we see this in corridors as well, but less so, right? So if they're at 975, their probability of moving to 1275 meters is only like one and a half compared to three and a half in the stopovers. And then in the West Okanagan, we see the same thing, this higher preference um, for intermediate elevations in stopovers and in corridors. They also, like the, the figure peaks at these intermediate elevations, um, but the strength of this is uh, lower, right? So it's only slightly over one is their probability of moving to a higher elevation compared to being at 975 meters. And then in Cache Creek, again, similar bell-shaped curve. Everybody loves intermediate elevations and same thing in the corridors compared to the stopovers. But again, the strength of selection, so how far this moves above one um, is lower in the stopovers compared to the corridors. So now we'll look at slope. So this shows slope in degrees changing on the x-axis, and this is still our relative selection strength. So if this deer is at a slope that's 15 degrees, their probability of moving to a 35 degree slope is over 1.5. So they're almost 1.5 times more likely to choose a steeper slope than a 15 degree slope in boundary stopovers. Um, and in corridors, it's the same. They still prefer these steeper slopes, but their strength of selection is lower. And again, these are both significant results. They have the little stars there. In the West Okanagan, uh, we see something similar. Although this strength of selection has changed, this is almost only 1.1, um, but they do still prefer steeper slopes. And in the corridors, again, they prefer steeper slopes, but um, less uh, intensive a selection. In Cache Creek, uh, same thing. Everybody loves steep slope during stopovers. And you might be thinking, well, I know what you're going to show me for the corridors, um, but it's not the same. So actually in corridors, it shows that they prefer uh, more gentle slopes in Cache Creek corridors. But you can see there's no star here. So that's why I've also grayed this out. This wasn't a significant result, which means that they kind of don't really show a ton of selection for slope, corridor, for slope in corridors in Cache Creek. And then for aspect, we can see here in the, um, the boundary region, they really love south facing slopes, which we would expect. Those are really sunny slopes. And so as they're migrating, those areas would have uh, a lot of green vegetation. And so they're really going to be into those south facing slopes. And we see this for corridors as well. Although again, their strength of selection is a bit lower. So instead of um, being over 1.2 times more likely to go to a south facing slope, they're only just over one 1.1 or less than 1.1 times as likely to move to the south facing slope. And then in the West Okanagan, we see the same thing, this love of selection for south facing slopes. And in corridors, it's the same. And in Cache Creek, again, the same. Everybody just loves the south facing slope. I know I do too. So that's not a surprising result. Um, yeah, and then in terms of burn, so this is burn use uh, relative or burn selection relative to being in an unburned area. So for um, in the boundary region in their corridors compared to an unburned area, they are more likely to choose a um, young burn than a never burned area, but compared to a never burned area, they are less likely to select for an old burn. Um, and we see uh, not quite the same thing in stopovers. So in stopovers in the boundary, their selection for never burned and young burned areas is pretty much the same versus their selection for old burns is significant. So the star has moved down here now, which means this is only significant for the old burns. But we can see that they, compared to being in a never burned area, um, deer would much rather be in the never burned area compared to the old burn. And then the Okanagan, again, we see something similar uh, in that compared to being in a never burned area, deer uh, do not like these old burns. And then surprisingly, they also don't like young burns in their corridors. Um, and so this might not, this wasn't really what I expected. Um, and then it also in the stopovers as well. So I would have thought that they would have enjoyed these young burns while they're migrating because I would think that they would be greener. Um, but according to the model, they uh, would much rather be in a never burned area while they're migrating. Um, so again, this is only during migration and not during um, the rest of the year or like in their, their um, summer or winter ranges. So just during migration, they prefer unburned areas. Um, 
And in Cache Creek, there was only a significant difference between old burns and never burned areas. Uh, young burns, um, this was not a significant difference between the two. And for stopovers, again, they really just avoided these old burns, but um, there was no significant difference between never burned and young burned areas. And then, yeah, so distance to roads is always something that we think about. And we can see here that if a deer is at 250 meters away from a road, they're over 1.2 times as likely to move to an area that's two kilometers from a road. Um, and <laughs> you're probably thinking it's pretty hard to find an area that's uh, two kilometers from a road, uh, especially in the boundary. Um, but a lot of these areas would be uh, in the Granby Provincial Park. And so we can see that deer can get over three kilometers away from a road. Um, and so that was significant for stopovers. They like to be farther from roads, uh, but in corridors, it wasn't significant. So we can kind of forget um, this result. And then in the West Okanagan, we see the same thing. So the x-axis is a bit different. The distance from road only gets to about um, 1,200 meters, but they would still much rather be um, farther from a road compared to being at 250 meters. And then in their stopovers, but in their corridors, they don't really seem to care. And then interestingly in Cache Creek, and this is something I don't know that I can explain quite yet, but compared to being at 250 meters from a road, deer would actually prefer to be um, closer to a road than farther from a road uh, in their corridors, but in their stopovers, there's really no significant difference there. Okay, so I'm almost done, but I just want to touch on some habitat types. And so these are the different habitat types that I looked at. So we have um, grasslands, uncut forests, young cut blocks, other old cut blocks, mid cut blocks, shrubs, and very old cut blocks. So uncut forests are places that have never been harvested according to the GIS and the layers that I have. Um, young cut blocks are zero to three years old. Mid cut blocks are four to 16 years old. Old cut blocks are 17 to 36 years old. And very old cut blocks are older than 36 years. Um, and then the other category just includes all the other types of habitats that exist, but in pretty low, um, low amounts. And so looking at this figure, our reference category is uncut forest. So you can see uncut forest is where this dotted line hits one. So we can see that in corridors in the boundary region, they'd much rather be in a grassland than any of these other habitats. Um, yeah, so they show positive selection for grasslands in their corridors. And in their stopovers, we see kind of the same thing in that they still prefer these grasslands, but we see a lower selection for all of the other types. Whereas in the corridors, these bars are all a lot closer to one, which kind of indicates that they're being less choosy, but in the stopovers, they, um, they're avoiding these much more than grassland and uncut forests. And in the Okanagan, so we see something really similar, right? So this is the line at one, and compared to uncut forest, everything's kind of a wash in their corridors. So they're kind of just um, using all of these uh, in about the same amounts or selecting for them in, a, in about the same amounts as they would the uncut forests. Whereas in stopovers, we see something slightly different. So again, compared to uncut forests, they would much rather be in a grassland, but they also show slight positive selection from mid cut blocks um, in their stopovers, and then they're avoiding um, these other habitats. And in Cache Creek, uh, again, in the corridors, everything's pretty much the same. And then in the stopovers, again, we see this higher selection for grasslands, and they're kind of avoiding some of these other habitats are selecting against them. So I know that was a ton of information really fast, um, but overall what we see is pretty similar habitat selection between corridors and stopovers, but a stronger selection in these stopovers. So if you remember, most of the figures were a lot more intense in those stopovers, so they were a lot higher, a lot bigger above and below one in the stopovers compared to the corridors. And so, um, yeah, what this kind of means to me is that they're being more choosy in these stopovers versus in the corridor. They're just kind of choosing areas that seem to be like easy to move through and they're perhaps less choosy. Um, but we also found that in all steady areas, deer selected for mid-range elevation, right? So all of those figures that peaked at about 1275. Um, and then uh, they also selected for south facing slopes and they all seem to really like grasslands and uncut forests. 
Uh, and then we also found that in the Okanagan and the boundary, deer selected for steeper slopes and areas farther away from roads. Um, and then except for boundary corridors, deer actually selected for unburned areas more compared to old and new burns. So all of this information is a ton, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I went through it really fast. But what all of these plots and figures, what they lead to are maps that look like this, right? So this is a heat map. This is a predicted probability of use um, of the landscape in the boundary during their stopovers. So I'm just highlighting the stopovers here because it seemed that's where they um, were showing a stronger selection. So we can see here the higher, the darker colors are areas they're more likely to use and these lighter colors are areas they are less likely to use. And you can see that they really are selecting for these mid elevations kind of on the sides of slopes. And then these big light um, chunks taken out here, it looks kind of like a mistake, but those are the burns. Those are the old burns that they really don't seem to like. And we can see here that they are not migrating. They're not walking up the valley roads. This here is the Christian Valley. Um, they don't walk along the valleys. They're kind of on these, these side hills, which to me, I would think is more of an anti-predator defense. Um, yeah, because they're on these steeper slopes uh, on the side. So then in the West Okanagan, uh, we have a similar map and we can see here, so this is the Princeton Summerlin Road right here. And we can see that that's a really dark purple color. And if we look at our migrations in this region, a lot of them do follow this Princeton Summerlin Road. It's a pretty important, and again, they don't migrate on the road. They, hide, they migrate on the hills that are um, on the side of that road. And they really seem to like that. And then in the Cache Creek region, we see here they're kind of avoiding um, this higher elevation point right here and kind of uh, selecting for stopovers uh, around it. And then kind of once they get up uh, this far north, um, th their selection is kind of uh, more stable. Yeah, so still to come, there's still a lot. I still have a ton of work to do uh, for my data analysis, so this will not be the last talk you hear from me. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, but I will be talking about migration in future talks. There'll be more survival stuff. Um, and then, yeah, the project is going to continue in a more pared down version in the future. So hopefully, um, yeah, we will continue to keep adults collared. And then um, that'll be kind of our focus for the next little while, while the project kind of decides where it's going um, from here. Um, yeah, and then like we mentioned at the beginning, I will be done hopefully. Uh, by September of 2023. Uh, that's me and my advisor, Adam Ford. We're going to be doing a lot of, a lot of number crunching um, in the next year and a half. So we have like a million people to thank for this project. Like I said, it's the um, largest collaborative mule deer project in BC's history. Um, we use a ton of people on the ground. This was our great um, neonate searching crew this summer, uh, but also all of these organizations have donated um, money or time or both, and we could not have done this work um, without them for sure. And so with that, um, I'm finally done. So I will, um, yeah, take any questions that you guys might have. Okay. Awesome work, Chloe. Uh, you got a few compliments and I thought it was a great presentation. Do you need a minute for a quick break or are you um, good for questions? Can I have one minute? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Right. I have to use the smallest room in my home. I'll be right back. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so while uh, Chloe steps away for a quick second, I see a whole bunch of our volunteers uh, on the participant list. So we have um, a number of volunteers who help with the mule deer capture, the doe capture, and the fawn capture, and um, the neonate capture. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, it made it really challenging to get people out in the field um, in big groups. But uh, I just want to thank everybody that I've seen on here, and a few of you have asked questions. We're also running um, camera traps, which is, we've got trail cameras across all three study areas. We've got over 150 trail cameras. I see a bunch of our trail camera volunteers here as well. Um, Sam Foster is the one taking care of that part of this project. He's the PhD candidate at University of Idaho. So just wanna thank all of our awesome volunteers for what they do. And maybe while they're, we're waiting, I'll play a really short trailer of Community for the Wild, which is a documentary that was done by Chris Spencer. Um, he's at UBC Studios in Vancouver, and it was uh, supported by TELUS. 
And this will be going out, I believe, Philippe, probably this weekend or on Monday um, for uh, the BCWF membership. So I'll just play the trailer really quick. Um, it's 30 seconds long and um, you can stay tuned. The BCWF will be communicating about this uh, film probably um, this weekend or early next week. We're really excited to see kind of mule deer in the mainstream. So here it is. Huge declines. I've seen it in elk and mule deer, record low salmon populations, endangered steelhead populations, endangered caribou populations. The question for people, is that what you want BC to look like 50 years from now? You know, animal X is declining. Why? What will you stop it? This is when you learn something new that's never been known before. So there's the trailer. It'll be out this weekend, and I see Chloe's back. So we'll start on the questions. We a lot. Um, I, I did it. Kind of answer some of these, but first question: Are all the studies conducted on does? Why are does preferred? Yeah, yeah. So uh, most studies are done on does, uh, and um, that's mostly because the males are really only important. Uh, for hunting, um, but also when it comes to breeding the females um, from a population standpoint, right? So um, we really only need, uh, I think it's like 10 to 20 bucks per 100 does in order to make sure that those does are pregnant and will give birth in the future. So when you have, like in an ideal world, we would collar everything and we'd look at everybody's survival and the movements for sure would be really cool to look look at for the, the bucks because they can have really different movements than females. Um, but when you don't have as much money and you're really trying to focus on what's driving the population of deer, it's really important that we focus on the females and then also their young because they're the ones that are contributing to the population growing in the future. And so we have done work um, we looked at it this year and in our first year of the project, making sure that all of our females are pregnant. And we, for our adults, we have really high pregnancy rates. It's close to 100% of all the adult females that we've collared have been pregnant and most of them with twins. Um, and so that's kind of the most important thing that we need males for is to breed these, these females and make sure that they're pregnant. And so that's kind of why uh, all the work really focuses on females, um, at least at this, this point. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, next question. Uh, we answered that one. Any impacts? So there's two around overpasses and highways. Any impacts with the Kelowna West deer uh, with the highway fencing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the deer seem to migrate just fine, like through um, through the underpasses uh, and the one overpass on the connector 97C. Um, and so it seems like they've kind of, I mean, that road's been there for quite a long time at this point. And so it seems like they know kind of where those under and overpasses are and how to get through them. Um, in the presentation, you probably saw, yeah, quite a few of the deer um, scoot under it and, and, and continue on with their migration path. Um, but it is something that we have noticed in, in some portions of the fence. And this is just anecdotally, we haven't uh, dived into this to see if it has a large impact, but it does seem like there are some parts of the fence where we do see um, more deer dying because they seem to be uh, chased uh, by coyotes or other predators kind of into the fence and then they get a bit stuck and then they, they die. So that's not great, um, but also if we think about uh, if we took the fence away, uh, I would venture to think that even more deer would get killed on the highway than get killed by the predators um, trapping them by the fence. And so it's kind of a lose-lose situation. Um, but I, I think that the fences are uh, important and are, yeah, we're losing less deer than if the fences were not there. And also saving a lot of people's lives as well. Because if you're going 120 kilometers an hour on the connector and you hit a deer, that is going to have some seriously negative implications for you. Thanks, Chloe. Um, and then under that, um, are the deer using the highway overpasses during their migration and do we need more of them? 
Um, yeah, so like I said, they do use them. They're mostly underpasses uh, on that, that portion of the, of the highway. Uh, but I think, yeah, we could always use more of them. Um, they use those ones. And I know Leonard Selecki with uh, MOTI is trying to look more into this. And so I've sent him some maps and stuff, but trying to see, and he has cameras up on them as well, like to see how many animals are using these underpasses. Um, and I think, yeah, there'd probably be no harm in uh, creating more, but I'm not an engineer, so I don't know, maybe the road would crumble, but I doubt it, yeah. Okay, um, do you have, this This is uh, maybe a bit harder because we were so early in the, in the work, what is the average mule deer life expectancy for male and female per study area? Yeah. That's kind of a tough one because these deer, we only know their exact ages when they do die um, because then we can pull a tooth and we can age them specifically uh, using that tooth. Um, but for, and we don't always get the teeth back. Um, and then in terms of males, I can't really answer that question because we don't have a lot of males collared. Um, and yeah, we only have a few that were collared as juveniles and then their collars fall off. So for most of the males, we don't know when they die. Um, and for the females, I mean, I would, I don't know, I could guess uh, what their survival or their life expectancy is, but I, I don't know. Um, but I do know that we have pulled some really old teeth from some really old deer in the boundary. So there were some deer that were um, like 12 to 13 years old when they died in the boundary and we pulled a tooth from them. So yeah, some of them probably are only living a couple of years and then, you know, we lose a lot of deer in their first year of life. But it does seem to be once, especially for a female, once they make it out of that first year of life, I mean, their survival chance is 80%. So it's pretty good in sub subsequent years. And so we do see higher survival um, for females. And so, I, yeah, I would think, I don't know, I don't know exactly what their life expectancy is, but it, it can be quite high. Okay, have you found in your research fires, floods occurring after their migratory patterns? Um, is that affecting migration, I guess, is the question, or are they resilient to those issues? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't, that's something, our study areas have been in places where fires occurred first and then we put deer in those areas and then we saw them migrate and we haven't seen too many of these catastrophic events, uh, for lack of a better word, occurring where our deer are collared right now. So the closest would be kind of the Skeetson fire from last summer up by Cache Creek. Um, that was obviously a huge fire that came through um, close to our study areas, but most of our deer were more on the Bonaparte side, so we're further west, and they didn't really migrate through that fire to begin with. Um, but there are a handful of deer that are maybe just two that migrate through there. And so we will be looking at those in the future to see if they do change their pathway. Um, but I would venture to think based on all the other work that's been done, mule deer are pretty set in their ways and they really like the roots that they have. So I would actually be quite surprised um, if a fire stopped them from migrating. Because um, if we think about our Cache Creek deer, a lot of those deer migrate from Cache Creek way north, almost 100 mile. And so that fire occurred quite a few years ago. And it, I would assume that they're still kind of making those same migrations they did back then, although we have really no way of knowing. But it does seem like they migrate kind of just right through the fire and keep going to where they were um, by 100 mile. Awesome. Um, here's one, they uh, have seen whitetail coming into our part of the territory. Do they really affect the mule deer population? Um, do you want to touch on a parent competition really briefly? Yeah, I can. I can. So that's kind of one of the things we're trying to figure out with the project is how all of these things come together and impact mule deer survival. So it's been shown that mule deer and whitetails do use a lot of the same resources, right? They eat a lot of the same plants. They can kind of live in a lot of the same areas, especially whitetails. They're really generalists. Um, and I wouldn't think that they, the mule deer are directly, or excuse me, the whitetails are like directly competing with the mule deer for their resources, just because there's, there's quite a lot of resources to go around. Um, but what's more likely happening is called a parent competition. And this is where, um, so you have two different prey sources and then a predator, and the predator is eating quite a lot of the, um, the whitetails and the mule deer. And so the, um, the cougar or the predator population can be a lot higher than it would be if they were just eating the one, um, the one species of deer. And so, um, 
yeah, so this like alternate prey source for the cougars or whatever predator you're, you're thinking about um, could be increasing that predator population and then they could be having a disproportionately larger effect on um, mule deer than they do on uh, white tails. And so that's probably that could be what's happening, uh, but we don't know that for sure. And so the camera work that's going on, so I didn't mention cameras at all here, but the camera work that's going on will hopefully help us tease that apart. And then along with my um, my colleague, uh, lab mate Siobhan Darlington is doing a big um, cougar uh, research project that she gave a, a talk to BCWF in the fall. Um, anyways, her work is hopefully trying to get at that as well. So yeah, the the, the cougar, mule deer, white-tailed deer story is TBD, but um, um, there certainly could be impacts, yeah. Yeah, and we will have Sam on probably in the fall to do a webinar, and we will have Shuan on in the fall to do a webinar as well. So we'll get we'll get both of them. Um, this is around looking at the burns under 10 years. Did you uh, differentiate in the curve for one to 10 years, or are you going to look into that in terms of use and selection? No, so I just yeah broke it up into less than 10 years and greater than 10 years, which I realize is a really large chunk of time. Uh, but in two of our study areas, so the boundary and the Okanagan, there aren't a ton of recent fires to begin with. Um, whereas in obviously in Cache Creek, there's the Elephant Hill fires, most of it. Um, but what I did do to kind of choose those breaks, in, and, and I did this with the cup blocks as well, is I ran kind of like a, like a first step RSF, where I looked at use and availability of these different ages of fires and different ages of cut blocks. And um, I don't have a figure, but it basically, it has the same like one line and then um, above and below based on the time, the, the age since burn and age since cut. And then you can kind of see what ages they are um, reacting to for lack of a better word. So I didn't just pull the 10 year, 10 years out of my butt and decide that's the way to go. Um, I did use, yeah, deer locations, so more used and available locations, um, and then how they used uh, those fires in relation to how old they were. So, yeah. Awesome. Do you have any recommendations for farmers, ranchers hanging in the summer and how they might be able to alleviate the concern or issues around fawns being stashed away in tall grass and avoiding hitting them when cutting? Mm, yeah, I don't think I have a great solution, but that does happen. Um, and it, yeah, it's pretty sad. Uh, I did my research in my master's research in uh, the Midwest and there's a lot of hanging going on there and they, they definitely killed quite a few. Um, but what I would say is that, yeah, I mean, if you hit one, um, I and, and you know you hit it, I would get out and I would search the immediate area for the for the twin because a lot of times actually all of the twins that we found were pretty much right next to the other twin. So I would say, yeah, if you hit one, I would get out and do some grid searching back and forth to make sure the other one isn't in there. Um, but otherwise, what you could do is look for a doe. So if you are about to start hanging and you see a doe kind of hanging out close by, that could be a good indication um, that uh, that there's fawns nearby. And so you could try and see how close you can get to the doe and maybe search around her if you're really concerned. Yeah. Um. What time of day does most migration movement occur? Is it daytime, nighttime, all the time? Hmm. Yeah, I didn't really look at that, to be honest with you, um, in terms of, yeah, what times of day they're moving. So I don't know. I would, yeah, I would think they're moving all the time, but uh, especially in those times when they're, they are just kind of in their corridors and they're just kind of zooming in one direction. Um, I wouldn't think that they care too much about what time of day it is, but maybe they do. That's a good point. I didn't, um, I didn't look at that. Yeah, the time of day. Um, and then uh, have you seen any effect from weather patterns in terms of stopover and migration? Um, no, again, I didn't really look at that either. Um, I, it does seem like the arrival of winter when they're on their summer ranges does kind of prompt them to start moving. Um, so in previous years I've looked like especially um, yeah in October if I know there's a big snowstorm coming the next day I'll look at the data and a lot of the deer have started moving right after like a big snowstorm. So I know that that can prompt them to um, to start their migrations but in terms of when they decide to make stopovers if that's related to weather 
Um, I don't know. And I don't know that anyone's ever really looked at that either. Um, yeah. Um, are we able to see trends towards more or less resident versus migratory deer? That, um, yeah, so from year to year, deer always migrate, right? If they, if they migrate, they're always going to migrate. And if they don't migrate, they're not going to migrate. So where I, and then a lot of, you know, our ratio between migratory deer to resident deer also depends on, you know, the deer that we're capturing. So we try to get, you know, as many, as many deer as we can in a random sample to make sure that we're not biasing it either way. Um, but I would say that I would be concerned about uh, migration kind of coming out of the population, so to speak, if resident, or excuse me, if migratory deer are more likely to die than resident deer, which is something I will look at in the future, but I, I haven't looked at right now. Um, but I think that would be the, um, the biggest way to see a trend in declining migration patterns is if your migratory deer are more likely to die than the residents. Um, it seems like, you know, these migration to resident ratios have been pretty similar uh, every year um, in terms of the deer that we're catching, but yeah, it's hard to like prove that, that it, it's stable. Yeah. Right, and in terms of that kind of 74, 26, have you looked at all in other jurisdictions to see how it compares? Yeah, I would say that's about typical. Um, in some regions, maybe it's a little higher migratory, but um, yeah, it's not common. Not many populations have 100% migratory deer, right? There's always going to be some deer um, that decide uh, that they don't, um, they don't have to move. Um, yeah. Do fawns of resident deer ever become migratory? So that's something that I'm really interested in, and uh, and that's part of the reason I wanted to collar these neonates and be tied to their moms, because as of right now in the literature, there's no proof of that happening. Um, everyone, it's kind of the prevailing thought is that if you're a migratory deer and you're born to a migratory mom, you're going to be migratory and same with residents. Um, but I know in Wyoming, they've been studying migration for forever, like I talked about, and they have a really impressive sample size that they're working with right now. And I feel like they're going to come out um, one day soon with a paper that will talk more about um, how deer are learning these migratory routes and if they switch from their lineage. Because what it really requires is you to collar a neonate from a known collared mother, from another collared mother, from another collared mother. Like you really need a long lineage of deer in order to make that happen. And we don't have that with just two years of neonate data. Um, but I, yeah, that's something that that I think about often um, is kind of how these migrations are passed down. And so hopefully um, those migration, the Wyoming folks will answer that question someday soon. Awesome. How similar are spring layovers to fall migrations? Would the maps be the same? I think you kind of covered that, but if you can cover it again, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I would venture to think that they would be quite similar just in the sense that they're using the same resources or they're using the exact same path, excuse me, on the way up as they do on the way down. So I would think that that would be quite similar like in terms of their corridors, but it is possible that the stopovers could shift a bit in terms of maybe on this in the spring, they decide to stop more in one area and then in the fall, they have slightly different stopovers. Um, but yeah, their routes are pretty identical between seasons, so I wouldn't expect too much of a difference. Um, how big are the migrating uh, herds uh, in terms of like the maternal units? I don't know if we have any data on that, but. Oh, like how many deer are migrating at one time together? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, because a lot, yeah. We can see in some of our data, like deer that we kind of catch together um, in similar areas, it does seem like they kind of migrate together, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they start off in the same area and then they just kind of like spread out. So um, that would be tough to answer without like cameras or something along known migration routes. Um, so again, in Wyoming, they've done that kind of thing and they have rather large herds that they see migrating. Um, but here I don't, I don't know. And yeah, we don't. I don't really have the data to answer that one. Okay, um, when are the majority of neonates born and does it vary by study area? Yeah, so the majority of the deer are born pretty much the first two weeks of June um, and it's pretty synchronized. Um, 
but I will say it does seem like in the Okanagan it's spread out a bit more um like they they uh they tend to give birth like they peak also in the first two weeks of June, but we still see um, some deer giving birth a bit later into June. Um, but that's just anecdotally, again, I can't like say that for sure, but that's just kind of what we've seen. Um, but yeah, in the other areas and and pretty much you could you can set your clock on it that by June 1st, there's going to be some babies on the ground June 2nd. Yep. Okay. Do you know anything about deer burn use in the fall migration or as winter range? Any correlation between an intensity of fire in use? Yeah, so that I, I don't know right now. Um, if, again, I think fall migration might be quite similar to spring, but in terms of their use in their winter ranges and their habitat selection in their winter versus summer ranges and how burns might factor into that, I don't, I haven't looked at that yet. Um, that is on my to-do list for sure, so that, that'll be coming um, because I do want to see how these um, their resource selection or habitat selection uh, in their migration routes, how it's different from their summer and winter ranges. And so, yeah, just because they're not using burns right now while they're migrating um, doesn't mean that they're not important in those other two ranges. And yeah, of course, intensity of burn can have um, a really large impact because there's some areas where, yeah, it's just a, a casual, like low intensity fire and that has less impact than um, those high intensity fires. And so when I get to that part of my analysis, I'll just have to see see um, how much intense fire intensity data exists out there. Um, again, it'll be quite sparse in the Okanagan and in the boundary just because there aren't that many recent burns, but I think there's quite a good layer in the Cache Creek region for the Elephant Hill Fire um, where we could see, yeah, kind of how the intensity of use is, in, the intensity of fire um, is impacting their use or selection. Yeah. Um, are you at the point where there are conclusions about barriers to migration? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of seems like the deer, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're all migrating, they're all moving, um, and they are crossing roads and they are using underpasses and overpasses and some of them cross Highway 5A um, to the west. So it does kind of seem like they, they are managing right now. Um, but in like, I always wonder, and I wish this well, it's not really an experiment you could do, but I would just love to build a wall, you know, go Trump, just build a wall and like, and see what the deer do. Like, are they going to go around it? Are they going to try and hop it? I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'm just joking though. We won't do that. I do not want to do that, but it, it would be an interesting experiment. Yeah. Um, for the neonate fatalities that are undetermined cause of death, would we be able to incorporate a camera into the collar? Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, so cool. And they do have camera collars for bigger deer, uh, for bigger animals in general. The problem is those neonate collars only weigh 140 grams. And so to integrate a, a collar into that camera that's, or excuse me, a camera into that collar that's already so small um, is not possible right now. But I would hope that in, yeah, like five, 10 years from now, um, I would think that that would be something the collar manufacturers would be trying to do because that would be helpful. See just a giant bear just come attack. Yeah. Okay. What are your thoughts on changes in winter range availability due to continued development in valley bottoms throughout southwestern BC? Southern BC is the development significant? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say it's it's quite a lot. Um, I don't have a figure, but I know Adam has made one before my advisor that shows like the um yeah, just like the amount of housing and development that's been happening in the valley uh, over the last like 20, 30, 10 years even. Um, it's quite high. And yeah, I that's something I think about a lot as well, because if we think about people complain a lot about mule deer being in towns and in um, towns that there never used to be deer and things like that. And I wonder if that could be because these towns are being built in mule deer winter ranges and the town shows up or the development shows up to houses and the deer are like, we're going to stay, you know, why would we leave? Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly the direct impact because again, we haven't had any developments um, occur in areas that we have collared deer. That would be really interesting to see kind of what they do when um, new houses and stuff are built. But it definitely, I would think it probably has a non insignificant impact on the deer um, for sure. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, did you compare your studies to Montana or other U.S. states? Um, yeah, I mean, so I have for the survival stuff. And uh, like I said, our survival numbers, except for boundary adults, but the other um, study areas and the other age classes are quite similar to what we see in the in Idaho uh, specifically. Um, so there, their adult female survival is about 82 to 85 percent. And that's what our um, annual adult survival was in Cache Creek and the Okanagan. Again, in the boundary a bit low, but we'll we'll get there. We'll try and figure out what's going on. And then, yeah, for the overwinter survival is, is pretty similar to those areas as well. Um, and then in, the, in terms of the migration stuff, there hasn't actually been a ton of work on migration specifically um, in, uh, in Idaho. And they're starting to do some work on it um, in Montana. I think some papers just got published there as well. So we'll see, but typically the migration stuff is, is mostly been done in kind of those more open um, sage brushy type habitats than it has been done um, here in, in the woods. Awesome. Town deer question. <sighs> Have there been any deer relocated? And if so, did they revert to their old migration points? Um, is translocation possible? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so none of our deer have been have been translocated. This is that's not what this study is about. It's not a translocation study. Um, but in the Kootenays, um, they did do a translocation study um, just a few years ago, and we actually published, I didn't do the fieldwork, but I did some of the analyses. Um, it was published in the Journal of Wildlife Management, um, where they did um, translocate town deer and moved them out, and then we compared their survival to um, wild deer or non-urban deer in the same areas. And we found that the survival of the non, or, or excuse me, the survival of the urban deer that had been translocated was about half of the survival of the, the native wild deer. And then we also found that a lot of those town deer that got translocated, a lot of them ended up back in a town, just a different town that they came from. And so then a lot of those actually got euthanized by COs and by the town officials because they had a, um, a no, um, a zero tolerance policy. So translocation is certainly possible. And if you don't agree with culling, um, then it is a good option in terms of um, it gives the deer like a 40% chance of living as opposed to a 0% chance of living. Um, but it's still not. Um, yeah, it's not without its uh, flaws, for sure. Yeah. And it's also extremely costly. Yes, it's expensive, yeah. And we could be moving CWD around, but anyways. Yes, yeah, and this was all done, yeah, well, well CWD was still an issue, but it was not as close to BC uh, as it is now, yeah. Yeah. Um, notice on all regions, 30 plus year old burns were least desirable. Wondering if there's an age that the area would become more desirable again. Anything in the literature that you can recall? Um, yeah, there hasn't been a ton of work looking on um, burned areas and migration specifically, just because it's not a, a typical cause of disturbance in some in the areas where the migration work has occurred. Um, it certainly is possible, but the the um, yeah, and unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of them here um, because fire was suppressed for so long uh, because those older burns, they range anywhere from 11 to like 30 something, no, almost 50 something years old. So there's a lot of variability there. And in a perfect world, I would chunk that up a bit more to see if maybe they do um, pick up in their selection as the burns get older and kind of um, regen. Um, but there's just not enough of them right now to be able to say anything about it. So I don't know, but that that is possible. Yeah. What GIS data in terms of base layers are you using? Is it VRI, VRI data and how old is it? Yeah, yeah. So most of it is VRI data, um, but then, and it's, I mean, the most current VRI data that I can get from the government. Uh, if you know of a better source, let me know. I'm always looking for better layers. Um, so that's where a lot of the, the stuff came from. But then the cut block layers are actually like a separate layer um, that are updated every year or so they tell me. Um, the forestry companies are supposed to submit um, their, uh, their new cut blocks by the end of fiscal year. So in two days, they should have updated all of their cuts from the previous year. Um, so yeah, so that's different from BRI data. And then the burns, again, there's like burn polygons that are specific, um, that have ages, and then yeah, I have roads and any, but it's all from mostly like data BC. Yeah. 
Awesome. Uh, we've seen uh, data for wildlife mortalities along five, Highway 5A in the North Thompson River Valley. Deer mortalities accounted for the greatest, the great majority. Some residents have expressed concerns over declining omega numbers in the territory. Can we apply any of our findings to this area? So that's um, in Simp, so that's up near Barrier. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I the Cache Creek region I think is quite is quite close to there. If I'm thinking of the right place, um, more the, east, north, straight north of Kamloops, basically, or northeast of Kamloops is where Barrier is. Okay. Yeah, I think I've driven through. I went to Wells Gray. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I would think that that region, the results from this would be rather applicable to there, just because it's it's pretty similar. Especially that's like kind of the mule deer. Stuff summer range. I know you guys have deer that probably live there year round, but for our deer, that's their summer range is that high. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, that road, yeah, not being fenced. So that's kind of one of those things where you have this trade-off between predators uh, potentially trapping deer in the fence and then also deer just getting squished at an alarming rate on the highway. So um, yeah, that is unfortunate. Uh, here's a, this is an interesting question. How many hours does a deer sleep for and does it vary? Yeah, you don't have that. I guess the callers just go out ping every four hours. That's all we get, right? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, but I would think it would be less than six hours just because we don't get very many, well, I got almost none, no false mortalities. So if they're sleeping for six hours straight, it would show up as a mortality uh, and that doesn't happen. So yeah, my answer would be less than six hours, but I don't know. <laughs> Does um, migration versus residence, we already dealt with the survival piece, um, any effect on fecundity between the difference between my, migratory and town deer? Uh, yeah, so not all resident deer are town deer, Jesse, but you can be a resident <laughs> and not live in a town. Um, it's an acceptable migration strategy. <laughs> um, but I would say, no, it doesn't look like there's any difference in fecundity between migratory um, and resident deer in terms of the deer being born. Um, when we go look for neonates, and I, I look at these locations every day, and we can see that, yeah, the majority of our deer are giving birth. Whether we can get to those birth sites and find the fawns is a different story. Um, but I would say, yeah, I don't think there's any difference in terms of um, the number of fetuses or the number of deer, or like the, the deer being pregnant between resident and migratory deer. Okay, here is an interesting one. Uh, have you explored reforestation of burned areas to assist in migration, i.e. replanting trees? Yeah, no, um, and that's something, yeah, so those burn categories are obviously very coarse, right? It's just, it doesn't even bring into the habitat type or what the forestry companies did in those areas during the burn. So what I'm hoping to do in the future, per, like particularly in the Cache Creek region where there is a lot of burned area, is kind of looking at um, areas where they did salvage logging compared to areas where they did not do salvage logging after a burn. That could have an impact on how deer are using or selecting those sites. And then, yeah, if you look at the different habitat types that were burned, obviously a burned forest is very different than a burned grassland. And in this, the results I showed today, it doesn't have any of that nuance in there. And so that's certainly something as I move forward and try to understand like why deer are selecting against new burns in some areas, not all. Um, that'll definitely be something I'll try to think about and try to bring into this is kind of maybe there's just one type of new burn that they don't like, um, and maybe there's other factors that make them uh, better for them. But uh, yeah, I don't know right now. Okay, awesome. Well, we're just over 8.30, so I think one and a half hours of talking for you is a pretty good lecture. <laughs> yeah, I so, don't normally talk this much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, great work, Chloe, and uh, Thanks to all of our partners and collaborators. I see a whole bunch of them on tonight. Ministry uh, biologists, um, our, our friends at University of Idaho, University of BC, um, Bonaparte Indian Band, ONA, uh, HGTF. Like uh, this is literally hundreds of people that have helped put this project together and all of our volunteers. It's been a major, major undertaking. So. Um, thanks everybody that supported the project and has been involved and volunteered and, and donated dollars and thanks Chloe for doing a great job and we'll have you on 
again next year, yeah. I guess. Give me more um, time, more results. Right. <laughs> yeah, and you'll be at the BCWF convention here in April. We'll be giving a talk. Um, I want to say thanks to Brian, who's been doing all the stuff behind the scenes and has done a great job over the last um, year, got quite a year, and then Philippe as well. Um, so for everyone here, if you can share this uh, webinar with your friends and colleagues and use it to help everyone understand the future of mule deer and tune into our series, um, we thank, all, thank you all for all your support and have a great night. Yeah, thanks everyone. You can send me an email uh, also if you have any questions. Yeah, we have a few questions here that I will keep track of and maybe we'll get Chloe to, to put them together and um, we'll put them out on the BCWF website. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Chloe. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.